good afternoon the formal introduction to the topic that i am going to deal today the topic for today's discussion is foregrounding foregrounding in stylistics so i shall be today covering some basic areas of stylistics i shall be talking about the objectives of understanding the use of foregrounding how the poets have used foregrounding or literary artists have used foregrounding i shall be also talking about the relationship between stylistics and foregrounding then i will focus on the axis of deviation and the axis of patterning both these are used in foregrounding i shall be talking about or rather introducing schemes and tropes to important devices that we find in literary text and these two words schemes and tropes are both integrated to the word foregrounding then we will go for an analysis of any literary text and then i will open for discussion and observation if you have any question you can raise so that i can move on with clarifications the main objective for this entire session is to familiarize you all with the word foregrounding that has been commonly used in literary studies especially stylistics we regard this word foregrounding as the central notion of stylistics in any text some linguistic items you know are given more prominence over others and through foregrounding on different levels the levels that we discussed last day the phonological the morphological the syntactical the semantic the semiotic and the pragmatic so based on these levels along with graphological level we will try to see how foregrounding is used as a device to arrest the attention of the of the readers to the text so this central focus of stylistics is basically to analyze the transformation of ordinary language to a text or a discourse the entire process by which ordinary language is converted into a literary text for close reading is called the process of foregrounding it takes its source material from the common place that we use every day in our day to day conversational language and by transforming that common ordinary conversational language into a into a linguistic item that will attract the attention of the readers or rather we give prominence to those linguistic items against the background of of the common place language the main purpose of foregrounding is therefore to attract the attention of the readers attention of the audience it is a technique that has been widely used in many forms of literature even performing arts drama drama also works on foregrounding it is a technique for making strange okay things that are ordinary do not uh, actually capture our attention so we have something rich and strange that is there in literature that draws our attention and through this attention we focus on this language so it is a process by which the language is defamiliarized in any kind of composition textual composition the original word that is related to foregrounding was introduced by victor slovoksi in the use of the russian word ostrania i repeat victor s h k l o v s k y slovoksi in the russian the word was ostraniani o s t r a n e i e so this word actually got transformed into the word foregrounding 
in English. Art or literary art is seen as an artifice that uh, actually lays or exposes, lays bare or exposes the content to the form, along with form, the technique and device. So he first of all said that art is technique. Art is not the spontaneous overflow of powerful feeling, rather art is a technique, an artificial form and therefore a work of art is constructed by certain formal elements and their arrangement. The concept of defamiliarization is closely connected with the concept of foregrounding and literariness. So literary language, ordinary commonplace language is turned into a literary language through this process of foregrounding. So foregrounding refers to a form of textual patterning of language through a conscious craftsmanship serving both the literary and aesthetic purpose. This involves, among others, a conscious selection and patterning of language. So sometimes this selection or patterning of language involves, last day we were talking about mistakes, galtis. Okay, it also involves distortion, it also involves deviation, some kind of innovation. And these innovations are conscious and motivated. That means the poet is very conscious when he is or she is deviating from the norm. And the entire deviation, distortion, mistake, all these are done with the sole purpose. And the sole purpose is, of course, aesthetic purpose. Literature serves an aesthetic purpose. Therefore, this aesthetically purposeful anomaly, mistake or distortion is based on linguistic deviation from an expected norm, expected linguistic norm. And therefore, innovative stylization of the form of linguistic expression through patterning and verbal parallelism. So often we find that literature deviates from the ordinary language and that makes literature different. The only compulsion for a literary artist is to convert the content and give that convert content uh, form that is very attractive. Therefore, the stylistician, they tend to investigate how any writer by deviating from an established norm and automated pattern foreground certain linguistic items to attract and surprise the readers. So I referred the book Geoffrey Leach. Geoffrey Leach in his book, A Linguistic Study of Poetry, English Poetry, actually talks about this. And he is using the term foregrounding. And he says that the foregrounding, that special name of foregrounding, this invokes, I quote from Geoffrey Leach, an analogy of a figure seen against the background. Okay, the artistic deviation sticks out from its background. The automatic system, like a figure in the foreground of a visual field. Therefore, like art, any text, literary text especially, a work of literature, can work on this type of deviation from the ordinary conversational commonplace language so that that linguistic item sticks out and attracts our attention. So this is done through some kind of deviation, some kind of patterning. Another Czechoslovak linguist, okay, Jan Mukarovsky, very important name in our field of study, Jan Mukarovsky said that any text is characterized by a consistent and systematic character of foregrounded linguistic form and content. I repeat what Jan Mukarovsky said. He stated that any text is characterized by a consistent and systematic character of foregrounded linguistic form and content. In his uh, famous work called Standard Language and Poetic Language, he therefore says, I quote from the text of Jan Mukarovsky, the function of poetic language consists in the maximum foregrounding of the utterance. It is not used in the services of communication, but in order to place in the foreground the act of expression, 
the act of speech itself. So whatever is attractive in case of linguistic item in literature is based on this type of deviation and patterning. So this maximum foregrounding of utterance, according to Mokarovsky, is not just to serve the purpose of communication, but rather to foreground something against the background of ordinary language. Even Katie Walls, the word actualization in literary stylistics, says uh, Katie Walls that this word actualization came to be used by some translator critics as the direct translation of the pra linguistic term actually say. So again, a new word in stylistics. This has come from the Czechoslovakian school, the pra linguistic circle, actualise, A-K-T-U-A-L-I-S-A-C-E. This word traditionally and more pro popularly is known as foregrounding. Even in the book of literary terms by J. Cudden, you will find the use of the same word. And according to Cudden, this word foregrounding denotes the use of devices and techniques which push the act of expression into the foreground so that language draws attention to itself. So drawing attention, according to Cudden, is very important in literature. So this way of drawing attention of the reader or audience to the way that the literary language represents reality is the hallmark of foregrounding or artistic creativity. So in case of poetic language, usually we find the use of foregrounding. Foregrounding is therefore the artistic technique of revealing the art and bringing the content into the foreground rather than concealing it. This type of literariness depends on the principle of defamiliarization or Slokovsky's concept of making strange in order to attract the attention of the readers to the foregrounded content. Say, for example, novel like Thomas Stern's Tristam Shandy. In this particular novel, we find various literary devices that are used to attract the attention of the readers so that the writer and the narrator, whatever they are doing, becomes more interesting. In poetry too, we find this type of foregrounding works to reveal art. You remember Philip Sidney once said that nature's world is brazen and poetry turns it golden. You must have wondered how this natural world of language is turned into something golden by the poet. So Philip Sidney has stated that nature's world is brazen while poetry turns it golden. So it is usually regarded as an early statement on foregrounding in poetry. So I was talking about Coleridge last day. Samuel Taylor Coleridge also talked about a similar type of foregrounding. In Biographia Literaria, he speaks of the essential difference between the language of poetry and the language of prose. And what is the essential difference? According to Coleridge, the language of poetry is different because poetry is metrically composed. So for Coleridge, the prime merit of any literary genius is this ability to represent familiar objects in an unfamiliar manner in order to evoke freshness of sensation. So we find this a form of textual patterning, which is actually motivated spe specifically for a literary and aesthetic purpose. So in the famous preface to lyrical ballads, Wordsworth is talking about no essential difference being there between the language of poetry and language of prose. Coleridge, on the other hand, contradicted Wordsworth and stated that the difference between the language of poetry and the language of prose is the metrical composition. It is a form that makes us aware of the literature that is called poetry. So poetic language is different from our ordinary conversational language. The language that I am using now is a more conversational language, dialogic language. Whereas in poetry, we have a different type of language. And these are different types of styles that are there based on the field of discourse, 
the mode of discourse, the manner of discourse. And accordingly, we keep on shifting styles, changing styles. The task of a poet is therefore to attract the attention of the readers by turning the language into something rich and strange. That's why we are attracted to poetry. We keep on visiting the lines of poetry again and again. We try to fill in the gaps in between the line in order to complete the poem. Glenn Brooks has stated that uh, if you paraphrase the poem, the poem is lost. Any kind of paraphrastic heresy should be avoided in order to understand poem. Because form is content and content is form, what James Joyce stated while referring to the works of Marshall Proust. So this formal organization that we find in poetry is definitely a stylistic linguistic organization that serves the purpose called aesthetic purpose. Therefore, we commit mistakes, but these mistakes are done in order to attract the attention of the readers. Therefore, any stylistician should therefore attempt to analyze the text and try to search what is the purpose of foregrounding. Number two, the stylistician must also search the method and technique used for the purpose of foregrounding. Why are these words brought to prominence? So I was talking about twinkle, twinkle, little star, the repetition of the word twinkle, twinkle, referring to tiger, tiger, burning bright, the repetition of the word tiger, or say water, water, everywhere. And you rightly pointed out that yes, the repetition is done for the purpose of attracting our attention to the importance of the word. So think of ancient mariner. So ancient mariner has just shot the albatross and the ship has been moved to a sea without any wind. It is a silent sea and the ship resembles a painted ship on a silent sea. At this time, the sun at noon is very strong. So there is no water to drink. And Coleridge is writing water, water everywhere. All the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere. Not any drop to drink. So this excellent composition, the metrical composition patterning is done in order to attract the attention of the readers. Number one, to the, to the sea that is silent, the water body, the large, vast water body that is there. Therefore, the repetition of the water, the word water twice. Then in the next line again, we have the repetition of the water. All the mariners on board are thirsty. Sea water cannot be consumed. And because the sun is very hot, the board is shrinking. They don't have water to drink, and because of the heat, the board, the ship, everything is shrinking. So drink and shrink rhyme, water, water repeated. Everything is done in order to attract the attention of the readers to the importance of the word water. He has committed a sin of killing the albatross, and now the punishment is there. It is fury of nature, because man-made disaster has been caused. Albatross has been shot, and that curse of killing a natural body, a natural organism, one life, comes through this punishment, the wrath of nature. And Coleridge has excellently presented this by arousing a sense of fear in us, a sense of awe and strangeness. And this conversion of something natural into something unnatural or supernatural is a hallmark of poetry. Coleridge, in his own way, tried to present the natural world in supernatural terms and supernatural terms in natural terms. As Wordsworth has rightly pointed out, that this was the division of labor between him and Coleridge. Poet Wordsworth would write about nature as it is, represent them by going close to nature, 
choosing incidents and situation from real life and presenting them in a language really used by men. So this was his form of foregrounding. Thus, we find that the language that Wordsworth is using is more conversational, more prosaic, not so ornamental like Coleridge. Coleridge, on the other hand, is representing a language, language that is related to the supernatural, use of the supernatural in order to generate a sense of mystery or wonder. And the supernaturalism is there in the works of Coleridge. Therefore, Coleridge, by converting the natural into supernatural or supernatural into natural, is also asking from us, the readers, the audience, a willing suspension of disbelief and to find some kind of semblance of truth between what is presented and what really is. And says that by bridging and finding a semblance of truth and suspending your sense of disbelief for a moment, both together will constitute the poetic faith. So he's also talking about foregrounding in his own way. How foregrounding is used to represent things in a new way, in a novel way, so that we are attracted to the lines. And after reading the lines, we get the feeling, oh, this was so well thought of, but never so well expressed. I repeat, oh, this was well thought of so many times by us, but not so well expressed. So this expression in poetry or the poetic communication depends on the effective use of foregrounding. This foregrounding can be seen in the works of most of the writers. Most of the writers who represent the world of grim reality in their own ways. So we have the patterns of images that are used, metaphors, similes that are used. And through such figurative devices, usually the poet makes an ornamental representation. Coleridge talked about this super addition. Super addition is essential in case of poetry. And such super addition can be based on either deviation, distortion, conscious mistake, anomalies. And finally, all these are done to serve an aesthetic purpose, to delight, to please, to teach. If we focus on the didactic purpose of literature, so we remember Sidney saying that one is delighted, then one is taught. So through delight, one can easily be taught. So without this delight, without this element of, of uh, delight, we cannot be taught properly. Therefore, this element of delight in case of literary language is done through an effective use of foregrounding. So our entire task today will be see, to see how this foregrounding works in case of poetry. So I shall be talking about two basics, basic ways on which the foregrounding works. So these are called the axis of deviation and axis of patterning. I repeat, these are axis of deviation, axis of patterning. So two things are there, ordinary language that is there at the backdrop and the poetic language that is used in poetry or literature works on deviation and patterning. Foreground therefore uses these two basic patterns. One is the pattern of deviation, the other is pattern of, of structuring the language. So both these are forms of linguistic distortion of some sort from the ordinary and commonplace language. However, such a linguistic distortion is always made consciously by the writer in order to serve the aesthetic purpose. By aesthetic purpose, I mean the way the thing is turned into a pleasurable thing that can generate some kind of, some kind of attention as well as delight. So in ancient Sanskrit literature, we have the concept of bhava and rasa. So bhava 
is like the iceberg that is invisible, that is submerged. The sthai bhava is submerged. So that is the state of emotion. While rasa is the tip of the iceberg that we visualize, that we take delight in watching. So that tip of the iceberg, that is the poetry, that is the literature used for communication, contains an attractive coloration, deviation, distortion, anomaly of ordinary language. So that this becomes more beautiful. So I'm using the metaphor of uh, the trope of a of a performance artist. So how will a performance artist makes make the dialogue more prominent? Say in cinema, you often find some dialogues that that uh, attract us. We remember those dialogues for a long time. For example, silent hoja, varna mein violent hoja unga. See how the patterning has been done. Two words are used, silent and violent. And these words are patterned together in order to foreground the content. So keep shut or I will become violent. That is ordinary language. And this ordinary language has been converted into a dramatic dialogue through a patterning and deviation. So that patterning is used in order to attract. Similar language we often find in advertisements. Advertisements, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, one minute, most of the advertisement contain such stylization of language along with the visuals. So visual foregrounding is not our area of discussion. We are more focused on the verbal foregrounding or the linguistic foregrounding. So we remember the famous advertisement where Akshay Kumar is there working as a mechanic. So there is a girl being chased by two boys. Remember that advertisement. So there we again have the effective use of language. Okay, that man jumps from the roof, comes down and says, Hey, mister, she's like your sister. That man shows his nails, says, Nakun, just uh. So Akshay Kumar, what he does, takes out plaster from his pocket and says, Plaster. So then the fight scene is on. So that type of advertisement is there, where we have again the patterning of language. So entire verbal, visual language of advertisement depends on effective foregrounding. So these are two axes. One is of deviation, one is of patterning. Certain components, as we find, of a text usually deviate from ordinary linguistic norm or such an aspect of the text is brought into prominence through repetition or parallelism. Such stylistic analysis works on the intersection of two axes of linguistic deviation and patterning. Say, for example, Tennyson's famous poem, if you remember Tennyson's poem, Charge of the Light Brigade, how the poet is using this type of patterning in order to foreground what is actually happening. So he says, so cannon in front of them, cannon right of them, cannon in left of them, volleyed and thundered. They are not to question why, they are only to do and die. Wrote the 600 into the valley of death. So see the use of the word cannon, cannon, cannon. Okay, front, right, left. So we have actual pattern. So if we convert this or paraphrase this expression into a prosaic one, we say that the soldiers are marching ahead in the battlefield and they find that cannons, cannon balls are being hurled at them from the front, cannon balls are being hurled from the left, and the same cannon balls can be seen hurled from the right. Yet the they are not to question why should they proceed. They are just there to sacrifice their life in the battlefield. So this is the prose language. A historian, while representing the same story, will use the ordinary language of history. The fact has to be presented in a literary language, in a literal language, without such poetic deviations. But when Tennyson is presenting the same story, he is actually patterning the language and working on 
deviation in order to foreground the importance of the violence. Even the words volleyed and thundered, these voices produce a sound effect. So several types of effects are used in case of literature, especially poetry, in order to attract the attention of the readers. So we again come to the famous definition of foregrounding and the deviations or patterning that are done. So deviation from a norm, what does it imply? That means something more or less the same is actually rejected by the poet and something new, something fresh, something strange has been selected. So this works on some kind of distortion, distortion from the ordinary and the commonplace language. Such linguistic distortion is made consciously by the writer. I repeat the word consciously by the writer. You don't think that the writer is not aware of this. The writer is always conscious. In rhetorical language, the oratory usually depends on this pattern of deviation from the common language. Such linguistic distortion is made consciously by the writer in order to serve the main purpose of literature. I remember, I remind you again, what is the main purpose of literature is to provide aesthetic delight, rasa, as well as to generate some kind of, of novelty in the work of literature or expression. So this more or less the same is rather rejected by the poet or writer and something new, new type of construction is used. If we go through the works of main literary artists, we will find such use. Say, for example, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice begins with the famous ironical statement. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a man in position of good fortune must, in, must be in want of a wife. Or say in James Joyce's novel, a portrait of the artist as a young man that tries to replicate the voice of a small child. Once upon a time, there was a small baby named Tuku, and he could only say cuckoo, cuckoo. And soon we also hear the voice, apologize, apologize. The eagles will pull out your eyes. So language that is used in those texts, say Pride and Prejudice of Jane Austen or James Joyce is a portrait of the artist as a young man. We find the ordinary language is changed, distorted. And there is a certain amount of patterning done in order to make the language fresh in order to attract the readers to that language. The task of a stylistician is to identify which are the places where the writer has actually deviated from the norm and what are the main techniques of patterning that are used by the writer. So whether the foregrounded pattern deviates from a norm or whether it replicates a pattern through parallelism. The point of foregrounding as a stylistic strategy is that it should always try to acquire salience in the act of drawing attention to itself. So that is the main important aspect of foregrounding, to draw attention to itself. So you remember in the famous play, Julius Caesar, where Antony comes on the stage and says, friends, Roman countrymen, lend me your ears. I've come here to bury Caesar, not to praise him. So why is the uh, is, uh, orator speaking in such a way? Why are these words more important? So in a drama that requires a loud oratorial confidence of the speaker, we require these words. When the Roman mob is so angry, they are shouting a lot and they are being after the supporters of Caesar because Brutus has already justified why Caesar has been killed. So in order to critique that act, Antony comes on the stage and says, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ear. I have come to bury Caesar and not to praise him. Actually, he has come to praise Caesar. So burial rites are to be done. But Antony has come to praise Caesar in order to say that this murder of Caesar was unjust. So he says that Caesar was ambitious. But what type of ambition? It was not a personal ambition. Rather, he was ambitious because he loved Rome. 
more than himself. So through this, gradually Antony, employing rhetorical devices, manipulates the situation. And the Roman mob, as you know, is actually influenced by the rhetorical address given by Antony, and they become his supporters. So such a linguistic foregrounding is done by the use of foregrounding that works on the axis of patterning and deviation. Can you make the idea clear how this language that hits our mind, hits our ear, and we remember the lines for a long time? Say, for example, if you are asked to memorize a poem of Tagore and asked to memorize the song of Tagore, okay, which one will you memorize easily? Yes? Which type of literary work will you memorize easily? The poem or the song? And which one will you? Yes? Vidisha, what were you saying? The song. The song. Okay, song. So any, anyone will challenge Vidisha's opinion? Or we all agree that song will be remembered by us easily? Song will be remembered by us for a long time? Song? arrests our attention easily. The song form actually arrests our attention and imprints on our mind long linguistic impression. Therefore, we remember the thing. And what is the secret? What is the difference between poetry and song? The basic difference is that song is rhythmically composed, metrically composed, and has certain amount of musicality in it. So we have Tagore's songs resonating in our mind for a long time because of the musicality, because of its lyricism. And lyricism does not come from nature. If you observe closely nature, nature has its own music. But the difference between natural music and artistic music is that artistic music is patterned. Artist artistic music is structured in harmonies, metrically composed. While natural music is not metrically composed, it's not harmonically composed. So the patterns that we find in art, symmetries that we find in our artificial world, these symmetries that are man-created, human beings create such symmetries. Such symmetries cannot be seen in natural world. You cannot find a perfect straight line created by nature. You, can find, you cannot find a perfect circle drawn by nature. But human beings, if they do not draw straight lines or circles, they cannot deviate, they cannot produce something that is artistic. So art is artificial. And this artificiality of art depends on normal, okay, structured representation. And this structured representation in case of literature depends on deviation as well as patterning. So a song contains both deviation as well as patterning. Think of a song, say Purano Shedinir Kotha, Amar Shonar Hurit Chai. Okay. Whatever song you remember, the common songs that you remember, even our national anthem, when you just recall the national anthem, so you will find that there is particular patterning. Say it, Bunkim Chanda Chattapadya composed Bande Matram. And in Bande Matram also, we have an excellent use of the matric, okay, mantric, matric as well as mantric language. And this is done, say, Shujalang, Shufalang, Malayajya, Shitalam, we find a kind of patterning. So very easy for us to understand as well as to memorize. Just by hearing the matric and mantric incantation, we can figure out the type of language that is used in that of work. And because of the musicality and lyricism, so Kadam Kadam Badae Ja, Khushi Ke Geet Gaae Ja, Ye zindagi hai kaum ki tu kaum pe lutaye ja. So do you find that this is a form? The content is same. So let us all march together, kadam kadam. Let us move ahead. And let us move to our desired destination and dedicate our body, our soul, our self to the development of the nation. So this is a language. But this language has been converted into very catchy composition. Okay, this composition is catchy because of the foregrounded, foregrounded 
deviation and patterning. So left, right, left, right. So it is rhyming. Kadam, kadam, bada, eja. See how interesting way the patterning has been done. And without that patterning, that rhythm, without that rhythm, we can understand that language will fall flat and it will simply become a lecture type language. So this is the effective use of patterning that we find in the musical compositions like Tagore's songs or the anthem of the Ajadin Forge. So foregrounding, we come to this conclusion that is an aesthetically purposeful distortion of ordinary language. So we must remember this definition of foregrounding. Foregrounding is an aesthetically purposeful distortion of ordinary language that is kept in the background in order to make the foregrounded content more attractive. Okay, ordinary language that is kept in the background in order to make the foregrounded content more attractive. So linguistic deviation and patterning, all these are done on different levels, both on the levels of form and content. So you may say that only formal changes are done. No, even the selection of word, the arrangement of the words and the meaning making, the semantics of the language, the meaning of the language is also distorted and patterned in order to have an attractive audience. Raymond jo Roman Jacobson, a famous linguist, in his famous work called Style and Language, he refers to the French poet, Paul Valéry, a very famous French poet. And he called poetry a sustained hesitation between sound and the sense. I repeat, okay, French poet Paul Valéry, on him, Roman Jacobson, okay, Roman Jacobson is comp commenting and he is using how the device of foregrounding works. And he refers to Paul Valery's important comment that there is a sustained hesitation between sound and sense in case of poetry. So we know that sound and silence, these are patterned in case of music. In case of poetry, sound, silence, and sense, all these are patterned. Okay, Jacobson therefore proposes a model of language which has six key functions. We call this the six key functions identified by Roman Jacobson. Okay, functions of language. So what are these functions? Six functions that are in detail studied under the heading called social linguistics. These are conative function, the phatic function, the referential function, the emotive function, poetic function, and metalinguistic functions of language. So among all these six functions, the most important is the poetic function. And this poetic function consists of making connections within the utterance with the help of words, with the help of images, with the help of sounds. And all these are interrelated, coded in a linguistic message. A poet is therefore a person who is coding language, language of poetry. And how is he coding? Or she is coding the language with reference to words, images, and sounds. So stylistic deviation and patterning work on the levels of words, level of images, and sound. All these three words are very important. The poetic function, according to Jacobson, stands out in respect of its particular appeal to stylistician. Poetic function is something that, I quote Jacobson, projects the principle of equivalence from the axis of selection into axis of combination. I repeat, Roman Jacobson is defining the poetic function as something that projects the principle of equivalence from the axis of selection into the axis of combination. Okay, so what are these two words? One is selection. Wordsworth, as you remember, also talks about selection of language really used by men in preface to lyrical ballads. Now the language that we really used in our day-to-day -day conversation, do you find that this language is used in poetry or you find poetry of the classical tradition or Elizabethan or Victorian tradition uses the ordinary language, 
Say for example, Wordsworth. Wordsworth's famous poem, Ode on Intimations of Childhood. Okay, recollections from childhood. In short, it is called Immortality Ode. So that particular poem begins in a very prosaic manner. In a very prosaic manner, there was a time when meadows, birds, and grove, and stream and every common sight to me did seem apparel to celestial light, the glory and freshness of a dream. It is not now, as it had been of you, turn wheresoever it may, by night or day, the things which I have seen, I can see no more. The rainbow comes and goes, and beautiful is the rose, the moon doth with delight. Look around her when the heaven is bare. Waters on a starry night are beautiful and fair. So this type of language is used by Wordsworth in his famous poem, Immortality Ode. So you find that this language is almost conversational, as if the poet is sitting in a meditative pose and that's recollecting the past and trying to recollect the incidents of early childhood of past trying to create poetry out of this spontaneous overflow of powerful feeling that has actually taken its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. But if you closely watch or observe the pattern that is used and the way the poem can be read, you find that Wordsworth and Coleridge do not differ as far as foreground is concerned. Wordsworth stated that I will select the language really used by men choose incidents and situation of daily life and then represent them in a natural way. My tasks will be almost like a poet who is natural, presenting the real picture of life in a language really used by men. Coldry stated that if you represent that language that is ordinary, it will not be turned into poetry. Because number one, as I mentioned earlier, that poetry is metrically composed. The second observation of Coleridge was that if you take the language and then talk about filtration of the language, ordinary language is filtered, and then you talk about arrangement of that language, and finally you talk about representation of the language for an aesthetic purpose. What type of language do you get? You get an artificial language. Therefore, Coleridge comes to this conclusion that Wordsworth's definition of poetry is also based on conversion of ordinary language really used by men into an artificial language of poetry. Thus we have a kind of pattern, with her is fled the visionary gleam, where is it now the glory and the dream in the same poem. To me the flower, the meanest flower that blows can give thoughts that are too deep for tears. In that scene, when the old poet, Wordsworth has grown old, is unable to rejoice the spirit of childhood, participate in the, in the May games of the rural world. So in that section, suddenly the poet turns more spontaneous, more rhythmical, more musical. Because we often find that people who are sorrowful, who are crying, who are in a state of deep agony, they sometimes speak in poetry. How does this happen? So there in this poem also, when this person is overjoyous, excited, what's with the poet, and he's responding to the, to the call of the wild world of sport and fun. Hey that pipe and hey that play, hey that through your hearts today, feel the gladness of the me. So don't you find some kind of pattern is done? So he is listening to the sound of the drum, drum, sound of the drum, and the children dancing, playing in the field. And he says that, e that pipe and e that play, e that through your hearts today, feel the gladness of the me. I in thought will join your throng, e that pipe and e that play, e that through your hearts today, feel the gladness of the me. So this main, the May fun, May joy is being enjoyed by the poet with the with the spontaneous overflow of powerful feeling. Even in Kubla Khan, you remember this 54 line poem has two parts. First begins in a very narrative prosaic manner 
where the poet is simply stating what he has dreamt or what he has read. Historical fact. In Zanadu did Kubla Khan, a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alp the sacred river ran, unto caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. So we find that this is almost a prosaic language and kind of narrative or discourse that does not depend on effective foregrounding. But in line 37, we are suddenly find the same poet breaking that prosaic narrative tetrameter lines or pentameter lines into a more spontaneous lyrical outburst. And suddenly the poet is energized and says, a damsel with a dull simmer, in a vision once I saw, it was an Abyssinian maid, and on her dulcimer she played, singing of Mount Abora. See the rhythmic pattern. Da, 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 da. Okay, and sa, 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 sa. So da and sa, both are pattern. I repeat the lines, and you find the music is there in the lines, in the composition itself. And through this patterning of the language and deviation from the ordinary language, a careful selection of words and arrangement of the words, the poet has actually drawn our attention and created one of the most enigmatic and lyrical poems ever written in English. A damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. So see the pattern, the regular pattern has been used. A damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. So the choice of words, the choice of sound and the use of image, word, sound, image, all these are combined together for effective foregrounding. And this is done through the axis of deviation, the axis of patterning. So these two are two forms Okay, for effective foregrounding. Number one, deviation. Number two, foregrounding. The poetic function therefore depends, as Jacobson has stated, that equivalence from the axis of selection and then into an axis of combination. Select from the menu of words, and then arrange those words so that the words become more effective. In any kind of literary work, therefore, there is always an attempt to establish connection between the word the writer actually chooses from a pool of possible words. Last day we were discussing the selection of words, if you kindly remember. So why has Wordsworth selected the word behold instead of the words like see, watch, glance, look, all these words were probable. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So why this word was selected? Some of you pointed out this word is a deviation. But why is this deviation done? If you go back to Bible, we remember the Nuha's Ark, the famous large ship made by Nuha. And the God promised Nuha that after the flood is there, the Organisms are rescued by Nuha in the Ark. Then I will send thee a covenant. According to the covenant, according to the promise, I will send thee a rainbow. And behold, okay, so if you look at the sky, you cannot see. But you have to behold to see God's rainbow. So according to the covenant, Nuha was promised to behold a rainbow in the sky. So once the poet is using the word behold, he is actually relating his experience with that of Noah, and what does rainbow symbolize in that classical text, biblical text, there the word behold signifies something, something spiritual, something holy, something that is beyond, beyond the grasp of man, something that is related to hope, to the promise made by God. And once that rainbow is seen in the sky, my heart will leap up. So the poet is again using the word leaps up instead of my heart throbs, my heart beats, my heart pulsates. The poet has consciously selected the word leaps up. Why has the poet used this word? Because the experience is almost elevated to the sense of sublime. By the word sublime, Immanuel Kant once stated that sublime is our failure to bridge the gap between the sensible and the super sensible. That means if you are standing before tsunami, okay, or you are seeing the last day you saw the avalanche, okay, the flood, when you see that cloud burst, so you cannot just comprehend the world. 
you are stuck with the sublime. So sublime, according to Kant, is a state of our sensation where we can not bridge the gap between the sensible and the super sensible. So something strange, something wondrous actually captures our attention and we are stuck with the sublime. So look at the sea, look at the sky, look at a mighty river, look at the mountain, hill, you will be stuck with that element of sublime. So that sublime is generated, therefore the poet has used the word lip sub in order to represent that sense of sublime. Therefore the heart is not simply throbbing, is not pulsating, is not simply beating or missing a beat, rather the heart is trying to leap up with a sense of joy. So it is a metaphor. So heart is not leaping, is uh, actually the whole being of the poet is leaping with a sense of joy. But he uses a word with reference to heart. So this is a kind of effective use of the word, selection of the word and employment of the word in the context. So employment of the word in the context. Poetic function therefore depends on connections or equivalences. So Coleridge was an excellent literary critic and he talked about this connection and equivalence, a semblance of truth in order to generate the linguistic message and sequence. Ordinary language is converted into poetic language with the help of meter, rhyme, symbols, imagery, distortion of language and everything is done through definitely patterning and deviation. So tiger, tiger burning bright, again remember that. So where the foregrounding is done in the lines, tiger, tiger burning bright in the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? Symmetry or symmetry, which one? Yes? So today you are not participating, I don't know why. All of you are silent. So tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry or symmetry? Which one? The last word. Symmetry or symmetry? Which one should you use while reciting the poem? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? If you sing this, yeah, it is symmetry. Because it is more, um, it it is more melodious. melodious. It is more melodious. It is, yeah. If you say it is more melodious, that means the poet does not know which word is rhyming word. So we always play the words rhyming. Okay, we remember the words that are rhyming. So in Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, this is not the problem. Okay. Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, how I wonder what you are. There is no problem. Star and R, rhyming. But in this poem of Blake, actually the poet who wrote Twinkle Twinkle Little Star was a disciple of William Blake. Okay, student of William Blake. So, do you think that the master does not know language and has used the word symmetry that is not rhyming with the word? Yes, which word? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye? A, B, A, A, B, B. That is the rhyme. So I. I, you cannot pronounce I, this word, as E. Symmetry. So you cannot pronounce that. So what immortal hand or E could frame thy fearful symmetry? You cannot use this. That means the poet gives more significance, more importance, more emphasis to a wrong word. Is it clear? Which one is the wrong word? Symmetry. Okay, that is the wrong pronunciation you are making. Pronunciation. Right? Yeah, pronunciation that you are making is the wrong yeah, word. Symmetry is. Okay. Symmetry because, is actually the word. 
Yeah, symmetry is the word because receive pronunciation in English, when you transcribe the word, it is always symmetry. symmetry. You cannot deviate. You cannot deviate from that. So when that is already fixed, you cannot deviate from that pronunciation. Why has the poet used a word that does not rhyme with I? What can be the probable reason? Because the poet has simply foregrounded the word symmetry against the background of ordinary language. So we are easily attracted towards not only the word tiger, but also to the word symmetry. Symmetry. So what is the great feature of a tiger? I was uh, analyzing this uh, use of the word tiger. First, I found that the word, this word tiger appears in Bible. Okay, this word tiger appears in Bible. And with the same spelling, T-Y-G-E-R, that we find in Blake's poem. Second, I found that this is an Asiatic tiger. So the people of England, they are not aware of this tiger. Whatever tiger they have seen, they have seen as a kind of puffed toy tiger. Then I found number three, the painting done by William Blake of the tiger. And you will find that that tiger also in the painting that accompanies the poem Tiger, Tiger Burning Bright is also looking like a puffed toy tiger with a smiley on its face. So if a small child of England who has never seen a tiger, who has only seen toy tiger, will that child be afraid of the tiger? Yes. No. So Juju Dakhanwarki. So is the tiger that Juju, whom the tiger will be afraid of, uh, sorry, the child will be afraid of. So why is Blake using this word? Then he is using the word symmetry. I found the contemporary illustration. William Blake himself was an illustrator. Okay, printer, publisher, poet, writer, had a printing press and he used to write and publish his own poems sell that poem in the market. So he was also lyrical because he used to sing the songs. The poems are written as songs of innocence and songs of experience. So he used to sing the songs as a bard. So he was a bard of Soho. Bard of Soho. Shakespeare is called bard of Avon. So here we have bard of Soho. Soho is a small place in England, London. So he used to sing. So for a singer, printer, publisher, such errors, unwanted errors, should be very conscious. Therefore, I found that he is focusing on two words. One is tiger, making this word tiger something strange, something very attractive by foregrounding the word tiger, using an archaic spelling of the word tiger. Instead of T-I-G-E-R, the poet is using T -Y -G -E -R. Okay, the archaic spelling is used. That is first way of foregrounding, something strange, animal, something strange is represented to the readers. And number two, it is the word symmetry. So fearful symmetry. Tiger is fearful, we understand. But what about symmetry? So tiger is symmetrical, natural tiger. The tiger of Sundarbon. William Blake was influenced by the report that came from Kolkata, from the Sundarbans. Okay, a person was killed by a tiger and that report was very popular among the readers. And from there he got the image of the tiger because an illustration was also there in that report. And based on that report, perhaps William Blake has written this word, this poem, Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright. So it has this Indian connection, the tigers of Shundarbon. So tiger of Shundarbon is symmetrical or asymmetrical. We, we know that the in biological world, okay, even in human world, in organic world, no two things actually match. They are not identical. Even Siamese twins, they have differences. Okay, no two things are identical. Even if you closely watch the leaves of a tree. Okay, the leaves of a tree, when you watch, you will find that all the leaves, although the, although they do resemble each other, they have different forms, they have different texture, they have different color, the spines, they are different. So this similarity is not there in the natural world. Symmetry, have you ever seen a straight line in nature or a perfect circle in nature? This symmetry is not there in natural world. 
So if the tiger is presented as something natural, the poet would have not used the word symmetry. Okay, because this is not a natural tiger. William Blake is not talking about the tiger of Sundarvan. Rather, he is representing that natural animal as something more ferocious, more cruel, more symmetrical, and more artificial, human created. Therefore, this tiger, tiger burning bright is also created in the mills of England. We have the entire imagery of the mills of England forging this metal into the image of a tiger. And therefore, this is the symbol of industrial revolution rather than the natural tiger. And in order to foreground that truth, foreground that reality, and allow the readers to think about the poem, he has used the word symmetry. Therefore, in nature, natural world, we never find anything fearful that is symmetrical. Say earthquake, avalanche, okay, flood, tsunami. Do you find anything is symmetrical? So nothing is symmetrical. Anything that is fearful in nature or natural world, nothing is symmetrical. Even a snake, okay, even a snake, you won't find snakes symmetrical or identical. Even the snake does not move in a straight line. Okay, when a tiger or a leopard or a cheetah is chasing a deer, you often find that they are not running in a straight line like our athletes, running in tracks. So in natural world, nothing is symmetrical. So there is something fearful about this object tiger, foregrounded object tiger, and fearful because that object is symmetrical. Therefore, you require an anvil. You require a forge. Okay, you require the entire mill, factory, in order to create that image of the tiger. So that type of foregrounding is done in a very conscious way by the poet. We often find this well illustrated in so many works. So ordinary and simple straightforward communication is minimized and the metaphoric or equivalent meaning is emphasized in such foregrounding. The spelling here is an instance of morphological deviation that the poet has used for effective foregrounding. It is an archaic obsolete spelling that is used to represent an ordinary tiger. Why should an ordinary tiger be represented or a natural tiger be represented through this distorted spelling or spelling mistake? So Galti say mistake, again the poet is doing it very consciously. Obsolete spelling is being used by the poet in order to represent a tiger that is also strange. This new creature, because of the special emphasis laid on this word tiger and again through repetition, draws our attention. So this drawing on a mathematical sense of mapping, projecting one functions upon another. According to Jacobson, this is the poetic function. And this projects the principle of equivalence from the axis of selection into the axis of combination. It is not only the selection of the word tiger, but also placement or emplotment of the word tiger in a set of combination. So therefore, tiger, tiger, burning bright. It has come in this composition. And if you break the composition, once upon a time, the child saw a tiger in the forest at the time of night or darkness. So that prosaic language is converted into something rich, something strange, something that is more meaningful and symbolic. Ordinary and simple and straightforward communication is therefore minimized. And the metaphoric or equivalent meaning is emphasized more. Any kind of stylistic analysis of a text therefore depends on this, this identification of deviation from the linguistic norm and the patterning of the language. Geoffrey Leach in that book, prescribed for your study, has also talked about this. That he says is an element of interest and surprise. In a, any kind of literary text actually depend on the foregrounded irregularity of form and content. I repeat what Geoffrey Leach has stated about foregrounding. He has stated that the element of interest and surprise in any literary text depends on foregrounded irregularity of form and content. So I come to these two important words, form and content. So in both cases, in case of form as well as in case of content, there is some foregrounded irregularity. 
or anomaly or mistake and this mistake is further aggravated because this mistake is a deviation from the ordinary language and second this mistake is set as a pattern there is a patterning of the mistake and therefore we have a kind of language that is more attractive and literary once we identify this type of language in case of literature we find that the foregrounded figure is a kind of linguistic deviation distortion anomaly and the background is the language the system taken for granted in any talk of deviation so when we look at a thing say advertisement billboard so what attracts us in an advertisement billboard what attracts us that is very important often in advertisement billboard we find mistakes have you ever experienced such mistakes and we are often to pick up the mistakes we human beings are very keen at finding faults we often can easily identify faults say a spelling mistake is there in an advertisement what do you think why is that advertisement spelt wrongly yeah to attract the readers attention yeah in the, in the field of advertisement that is used consciously very consciously so as we human beings are excellent at fault finding excellent at fault finding that is our task so in an advertisement usually we ignore but once we can identify a faults we have sense of supremacy sense of superiority so we say that oh, the spelling is wrong see look 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 e baba color is spelling jane na c o l a r k o l a r likheche why is this mistake done understand but that mistake has been done consciously so ordinary c o l o u r you might not read an american will not read c o l o r so ordinary language but if that is spelled k o l o r k o l o u r so you will see oh the person has done wrong has done a mistake he has not used that correct spelling of the word so naturally what will happen you will read that again and again and it will draw your attention to that anomaly to that mistake foregrounded in some cases it becomes not very prominent in some cases it becomes prominent so the task of advertisement is to foreground the message in some cases it fails because you are more aware of the mistake without seeing the content of that advertisement so you talk about the mistake without going through the content but while discussing the same fault the mistake with your friend you will be referring to the advertisement so dhoonte reh jaoge remember that advertisement yeah any kind of modern advertisement think of the language that is used in the language in the advertisement so the patterning is musical is lyrical is based on words how the words are used but it is also dependent on something that is anomalous okay mistaken so we have an interest in any literary text depends on foregrounded irregularity of form and content so foregrounded figure is the linguistic deviation and the background is the language the ordinary language the system that is taken for granted so a person who is well dressed in formal dress okay we won't look if that person appears in something in some strange dress naturally that person will be identified so in say procession okay if a large number of persons are walking in a procession so who are more attractive those who actually deviate from that okay those who have very catchy placards in their hand or those who are dressed in such a way that they draw attention so anything that is based on deviation irregularity as well as patterning serves the purpose of foregrounding in language literature <coughs> is distinguished by consistency and systematic character of foregrounding so we come to our conclusion any kind of literary work is therefore dependent on a consistent okay and systematic character of foregrounding and this foregrounding depends on deviations and patterning of different levels so just let us recall what are the different levels and come to our conclusion 
what are the different levels of foregrounding that is done? So first, on the level of the smallest unit of language, minimal, indivisible, distinct unit of language, phonemes. Okay, phonet phonological deviation, phonological pattern. Full fathom five. Where is the phonological patterning? Thy father lies. So first, full fathom five. Where is the patterning? Which linguistic item is patterned? Initial consonant at the beginning of the words. And this device, figurative device is called, you all know, the repetition of the initial consonantal sound in a line is called? Alliteration. Alliteration. So alliteration is a phonological deviation. Alliteration is a phonological patterning. Therefore, the foregrounding is done through the repetition of the initial consonants and selection of words that contain that initial consonant for full fathom five. Thy father lies. So we have a repetition of the labiodental sound for in the words in the initial position. So second is graphological. Graphological, the image of the text that we find. So poetry is different from prose because in a piece of poetry printed on a page, we find the blank space is more than the printed space. Okay, in case of prose, margin to margin, the lines are printed. But in case of poetry, we find more space is left out. Okay, between the stanzas, on the side of the lines, extra margin is left. Okay, that is the graphological imprint. The punctuation marks that are used, the rules of capitalization that are used, all these are done with the purpose of foregrounding. So in Blake's poem, Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright, the second word, tiger, is it capital or small? Yes, the second word, tiger. So small, capital. Yeah. Capital. Second word, in, tiger. Oh, second word? Second word? Small. Small. Yeah, it's in small letters. Uh, it's not in, in capital poem, letters. It is. Yeah. In this poem, the second tiger is in capital letters. Okay, is it printed by... I said no, William Blake was himself a printer. He used to write his poems, publish the poems in writing. Later on, the printers took that. I was watching that original prints, and in that print, I saw that it is in the small letter, not in the capital letter. Okay. But it is it is calligraphed in such a way, written in such a way by his handwriting, is such a way that it resembles a capital letter. So for a printer, modern publisher who is printing in the Times New Roman or Arial font, he has to select one. I hope that William Blake has used that in the small letters. But if he has used, I say, if he has used in the capital letter, that means it becomes a proper noun. Tiger becomes a proper noun. That has a different meaning. Okay, the selection of the word tiger. I said he has selected a word. So graphically, we see use of capitalization. In some cases, the first, first letter of a line in a poem usually begins in capital letters. Okay, all the lines of a poem begin in capital letters. This is an ordinary form. But in several poems, we find that uh, the initial letter is not written in the capital. Rather, it is written in small letters. What can be the reason? Again, the foregrounding, the run on lines, the same line is continuing, therefore the poet thinks that no capitalization. Capitalization is avoided. So such kind of graphological deviation and patterning is used. Now third form, so once you arrange the words in a system of combination, grammatical, meaningful, so you have grammar. And in case of grammar also, we often find Poetic license often used. Okay, poetic license. This is the license given to poets. Poets can change the language, can distort the language, can repeat the word, can create wrong sentences. But this is done with the purpose of aesthetic delight, for the purpose of rasa, so that the audience can relish the juice that is produced, the rasa that is produced by the literary text. Alamkara. Okay, alamkara in Sanskrit poetics is used in order to entertain the audience with the juice, with the rasa. Similarly, in English poetry, we also find such kind of 
syntactical deviation has been done in order to produce the desired effect. Okay, the plowman homeward plods his weary way. Okay, the way is weary or the plowman is weary? Who is weary? The weary plowman plods his way, plods on his way, or the plowman plods on his weary way. Which one? Who is weary? The plowman or the road? Yeah, definitely the plowman is weary. But instead of that adjective being used there, there is a transfer of adjective from one place to another. So we have a deviation from ordinary language, ordinary grammatical language. And therefore, the poet has created a wrong grammatical, ungrammatical utterance. But once we read the line, we understand, oh, okay, the way is not weary, the way is not tired. It is the plowman, the farmer who is tired. And in the evening, he is moving way back to his home. Therefore, the poet has used that in a figurative way using the device called transferred epithet. Fair is foul, foul is fair, hover through the fog and fill the air. So what is the meaning of the first line? Fair is foul, foul is fair. So A is B, it is obvious that B will be A. Is it not obvious? If fair is foul, is it not obvious that the foul will be fair? Yeah, in ordinary prosaic language, in ordinary prosaic language, I cannot use this. I cannot use this. So I am SBS, SBS am I. Why should I use? Once I have made the statement, why should I repeat the statement? So chiasmus is a device that is used figuratively in order to make that line sentence more interesting and more meaningful. Thrice to mine and thrice to thine, thrice again to make up nine. Shakespeare is writing composition like this. So is it grammatical sentence, utterance? Once again, no. okay, so selection morphological, the word thrice, the sound, thrice to mine and thrice to thine, I, nine, 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 thrice, thra, thra, thra. So repetition patterning of the sound. Then the syntax. So syntactical, deviation and patterning. Then we have this done on the level of semiotics, meaning. So words have different meanings. At least four kinds of meanings are there in case of words. One, the literal dictionary meaning. Number two, the grammatical meaning, grammatical use of the word. Number three, the contextual meaning, where the word is placed in the context, in the environment. And number four, the symbolic meaning. Arthur Simon says that what are words themselves are symbols. Whenever a word cross three folds levels of meaning, the words become symbol. So what are the four, word, four phases, four kinds of meaning of a word? Number one, the literal dictionary meaning. Number two, the grammatical significance, grammatical usage. Number three, the meaning in the context of the sentence. And number four, extra literary extra contextual significance. Okay. Therefore, the word is turned into a symbol when we have the fourth meaning. So any kind of analysis of language in poetry or literature that involves analysis of deviation, analysis of patterning will include the central notion of linguistics, of stylistics called foregrounding. Okay. It is also done on the level of discourse semantics, okay, discourse, pragmatics, discourse. Discourse is the field where the language is used for utterance, for communication. Okay, in case of discourse, we have a person who is speaking and a person who is listening, the addresser and the addressee. And according to the addresser, addressee relationship, language changes. So it can be a soliloquy, it can be a monologue, it can be a speech. Okay, soliloquy, one is speaking to oneself. In case of monologue, person is imagined and the person is speaking to that object of imagination or person imagined by him or her. Number three, it can be a speech where a person is present and you are delivering a speech. Therefore, we have different types of speech act. Accordingly, we have different types of literary expression modified by the speech act. 
deviation of language according to the speech situation according to the requirement of the speech act and finally we also have a, an analysis of the interrelationship between form and content that is most important how the content is made more visible attractive with the foregrounding of the content with the help of of the deviation change in form and change in content patterning of form and patterning of content therefore foregrounding we conclude is the central notion of stylistics thank you very much for your audience so it was more of a yeah i do not know if this is dialogic or soliloquy so i was talking to myself more often so thank you for your attention okay so i conclude my lecture here if you have any questions you can ask please